Suarez swings, hits one high in the air, very deep left center field, it is gone! A. Eugenio Suarez gets the Reds on the board with his 30th home run of the year. Boy, he just continues to light up the month of September. That's his seventh home run this month. A route for the Reds concludes the home slate of this regular season and guarantees the Red Legs a winning year. Hey, this is John Sadak, TV voice of the Cincinnati Reds, and you're up for late night Reds talk. What's going on, everybody? It is Wednesday night, and you know what that means. Another edition of Late Night Reds Talk Live. Unfortunately, this is the eliminated edition, but uh, we are not going to sit there and hang our heads on a disappointing finish to the year. We're going to talk about how much fun the 2021 Cincinnati Reds were to cover. We are going to get into how this could have been different. We're going to talk about some highlights, some lowlights. We're going to get a bunch of thoughts, and we've got a ton of questions for this episode to get to. Thank you all so much for that. We're very excited. I am Tim Daniel here, as always, with writer of Red Leg Nation himself, Mr. Cincinnati Reds Twitter leader himself, Mr. Nicholas Kirby. <clears throat> going on? Just uh, watching uh, Cincinnati Reds and designated hitter Delino to Shields this evening. I mean, what more in life could you possibly want? Yeah, I like your shirt, by the way. Yeah, wife got it for me. I like it. I've had this since, like, Griffey got inducted. What was that, 16? I'm not sure if I could get a shirt on from from 16 uh, <laughs> uh, around my, my leg, so. That's, that's, that's not what I'm trying to do here, bud, by any means. Um, <clears throat> if you are checking us out on the YouTube, you are recognizing Carlos is not with us just yet. He is doing some family things. He should be joining us later today, uh, later tonight for the show. We're going to talk about that. But let's go ahead and we'll get into the topics of discussion. Uh, we Like I said, we have a ton of questions. If you have more you want to add, we will answer them tonight if you're here in the chat hanging out with us. So thank you, as always. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, I want to say one more thing before we get started. I just want to let everyone know, uh, for this being our first season, for Nick and I coming up with this idea, literally through a Twitter DM, um, <laughs> This couldn't have gone better. Um, obviously, it would have been awesome to be talking about this team in the playoffs, but you know, for the two of us and Carlos, it's been awesome. Uh, we've had some guests we never thought we'd ever be talking with. Um, we got a lot of great fan interaction. You guys, you know, talk with us during the show. You guys send us questions on Twitter. It it means a lot. Um, I've been podcasting for twelve years, and I've been begging for this interaction in all my shows. So to finally have this here has been awesome and we're going to keep trucking and we'll let you guys know what that plan is. Um, but Nick, before I get all sentimental and crying and all that stuff, um, we got to start with, look, it sucks. We know they're not playing in the playoffs, but for only the fourth time in the last 20 years, this team does end the season with a 500 record. I was there to watch them clinch their 500 record two straight seasons, having a 500 record for the first time since the 2012 and 2013 seasons. Um, you know, I feel like as much as we're all disappointed, there's no postseason. Um, we shouldn't take what grant for granted what we had this year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've talked, this was a team, uh, projected by fan graphs to win 79 games. Um, the highest they got at any point this season was 88 in the projections, which is what the Cardinals are at right now with, with still five games left to play um so of course you know, it's it's i think it's more probably disappointing in terms of um you know just just how the last two decades have gone more so than this year you know i feel like what this team did and what this team did was able to accomplish i feel like was was you know i think pretty special and um it was a very very fun season so i, th- I feel like it's best to kind of try to look at it in and the perspective of just this year and just the team and the players that were assembled and kind of what they were able to accomplish. And I feel like if you look at it that way, you're probably going to feel a lot better at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree. Um, I still feel like too, cause I know a lot of people I've seen the Twitter conversations and, you know, there's a lot of people who are like, I don't feel very confident about this team for 2022. And I don't know if I understand that. I mean, you're already looking at, the five guys who started majority of your games this year are under contract, you know, so it's not like you're like really panicking there. 
Um, I don't know what the bullpen's going to look like, obviously, but you got to think, you know, Luis Sessa, he's obviously going to be there. Uh, I just saw Cowboy yesterday saying that he discussed him being in the rotation, which I wish Carlos was on here to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> but you know, he's going to be there. Um, you know, you know, more than likely Michael Lorenzen, I know he's got a free, this is free agent year. What happens with him? But even, you know, offensively, look, I know the big thing hanging over his head is Nick Castellanos is likely to opt out. And I get it, the, the concern there, but, you know, looking forward, building off of this year with all the prospects you have, like, I don't really know if I'm necessarily panicking that they're not going to be good for, again for four or five years. I don't understand the logic behind that because their farm system is rebuilt and looks really good. Well, I mean, I think you just start with, Luis Castillo and Tyler Matley. Um, there's not a lot of teams in baseball that have a better one-two punch than that. And the Reds have both of those guys locked up for the next two seasons. Um, of course, Gray's locked up for next year. He's definitely a potential trade candidate. Um, and it's, I think something we'll, we'll cut with we'll kind of a similar, somewhat of a question of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you start with those two guys, uh, that's a really, really good start. And you know, there's a lot of young, you know, talented offensive pieces with India and Stevenson. Um, looks like Votto's got some some more life le left in his bat. You know, Winker. There, there's a lot of really, really, really good pieces on this team. Um, and, you know, I, I know everyone is, uh, you know, um, some of the news we've heard over the last, you know, couple of weeks. Remember, the Reds won 97 games under Bob Castellini at, at one point. Um, right. he could be a terrible owner. <laughs> you could still win with a terrible owner. There's yeah. lots of teams that are going to be playing in the playoffs this year with terrible owners. Um, <laughs> Seattle. So I, 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 if you really put all your faith in your, your, uh, I don't know, your emotions into who owns the team, fans of most teams would be pretty disappointed. I would say. <laughs> yeah. If you don't root for like the Lakers or the Yankees, then like, you know, there's not really, if you're, if you're like basing on ownership, then like, it's not the way to go. That's not the way to be the fan. And I understand that, you know, it's the big, what if is, you know, what if they tendered Bryce Iglesias and Archie Bradley? What if they made efforts for the bullpen? Um, but, you know, I feel like if that's how we're just going to always look at this year, then we're really doing this season a disservice. You talk about, you know, you're going to have the National League Rookie of the Year this year. Um, I don't think anyone's taken from that from him in the last five games of the season. And you talk about the resurgence of Joey Votto when, you know, a lot of people question, will we ever see him be really good at baseball again? And he certainly was, obviously. Um, you take away from Eugenio Suarez's September where he came back and has hit really well. Um, I know the stat line doesn't look good for the season, but, you know, that September gives you something to build off of and believe in. So, yeah, I don't think I'm freaking out about this. You know, I know that uh, financially they're not strapped by any means. So, you know, if Nick Castellanos leaves, I know this isn't the best free agent class, but um, I don't think they're going to be like shit out of luck by any means. Um, you know, like a Kyle Schwarber, would he look bad in left field in Cincinnati? I don't think so. But, you know, the Red Sox also might want to keep him. So we'll see. No, no more, no more. <laughs> don't, we don't need two winkers out there. Um, that's a whole other, other story, but I really do think defense is the most, um, yeah. uh, the most unseen reason for the Reds, uh, you know, not, not getting over the top. You know, I don't know if that was the sole reason, uh, but I think, I, I think that might be just as close to the bullpen. And I know a lot of people think I'm crazy, but um, when you look at the amount of, you know, defensive run saves or outs above average, whatever you, you, you want to uh, quantify and you compare that with like the Cardinals, it is a astronomical difference between the two and just turn on a Cardinals game and watch their outfielders. They have like three center fielders out there and, and you know, that stuff all adds up and it, 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 it sneaky adds up on you. So um, yeah, I don't, that's something I really would like to see the Reds, you know, kind of, um, um, you know, look at and, and address is, is trying to find some better um, defensive players. But, you know, spending money, sure, it would have been great. We all wish the Reds would have done that, you know. Um, 
I don't think Iglesias by himself gets this team over the top. No. It's closer. No. The Reds are probably in a more interesting spot. Um, but let's not forget who the Reds' top free agent target or the, the biggest rumor was Didi Gregorius this offseason, right? Yeah. Kyle Farmer completely outperformed him. It, it's not even close. So, I mean, like people would have felt better about that, but it would have been a detrimental move. And it, think about this. The Reds signed Didi Gregorius this offseason. Does Jonathan India ever become Jonathan India? Nope. Because he wouldn't have been on the opening day roster. Not at all. No chance. And um, it took him almost two months to get going. And so, I mean, you know, there's always so many what ifs, but, you know, and maybe the Reds completely lucked in. Well, I'll say it, the Reds did completely luck into the Jonathan and India yes, situation. Let's, let's be clear. But, man, it worked out. And Jonathan India is the most valuable player on the Cincinnati Reds in 2021, in my I, opinion. I he completely leads, agree. He leads in, in wins above replacement. And, I mean, he's been on the, he, he, um, not to anyone else's fault, but he's been on the team all year. He, didn't miss a month, you know, because a Brewers right. pitcher threw it his hand, although he did get hit a billion times, but somehow yeah, he did. He's never gets hurt um, or never hurt to get out of the game. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, there's so many what ifs and, you know, you move, it's like you move one piece. Well, this piece might fall and you move one piece, this piece might fall. So I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a weird season, a good season, a lot of interesting parts and pieces and um, just one of the most, wild seasons where so much happened um over the course of a year it was it, it was a roller coaster but you know what you know what this last month say what you want man you watch a game like tonight I'm, I'm a diehard reds fan i'm having a hard time getting really interested in this game i didn't have that problem even a week ago man i was locked oh. in and that's just that's a great feeling and, and i hope i hope we have that feeling <clears throat> Uh, the majority of seasons to come because it's just it's such a different vibe and it's so fun and it's so exciting and the hope and the belief and the just the energy that it brings yeah but if you read twitter they act like it's like the last five years of the montreal expos is what the reds were this year and that's <laughs> asinine it's like no they were good they were a good baseball team it just the vancouver you know, reds right shit just didn't go their way it happens um the yankees have had years where things didn't go their way they didn't make the playoffs and had a winning record it just is what it is. Maybe that's a bad example because they've been mediocre for about 20 <laughs> years. But um, anyway, all right. So let's kind of move around. So obviously with them being eliminated, um, that means the St. Louis Cardinals will be playing the LA Dodgers in the wild card, it looks like. And the Cardinals are winners of 17 straight. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So the question really here is, was it more about what they did in September or was it about the Reds not being able to hold on to it? And <clears throat> I think it's fair to say there's a little bit of both, but I feel like just, you know, what was it? The Reds would have to have gone, if the Reds had gone seven and three, they would have been like, they would have had the spot still or been tied or something like that. Um, I don't remember exactly how that went, but I don't, I kind of, you know, as much as you hate to do it, you know, the devil magic looks to be real. I guess you got to tip your cap. I mean, this is a team that didn't look very good being St. Louis for majority of the year. And now they're having that freaking 2004 money ball end of the year run. And it's driving me crazy. But at some point you just kind of got to, you know, respect where respect's due. It's a franchise that knows how to win. You know, they're, it's very rare. The Cardinals are out of it. So, you know, I, I, I always, you know, I just like the pirate. This morning, I just like the Cardinals strictly because I respect the Cardinals too much for being good. Yeah, I mean, you have to tip your, your cap to the, the Cardinals. Whenever you have a team that wins something like 17 games in a row, it's a combination of a lot of things. It's a combination of them playing really well, them, them you know, finding good players, whatever, and a lot of luck. It, it, it always is a combination. It can't be one or the other because you're not right. going to get lucky without talent and win 17 in a row. And you're not going to be talented without lucky and win 17 in a row. So um, you got to give them a lot of credit, you know. Um, I despise Mike Schilt, but man, you got to give that guy credit because that looked like a sinking ship and he kept them afloat kind of like David Bell last year, you know, yeah. it was kind of the same, same concept where, man, they just, they felt completely out of it. And, um, you know, he kept them, kept them going, kept the energy going, whatever, all the cliches you want to say there. And, and, and they got on a run. Um, 
like I've already said, their defense. I mean, that I think that was a huge part. If you watch, I've watched way too many Cardinals games this year, man. You, you really this last month, you saw their defense just really stand out when they were all healthy. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, and, and I have no idea how they won 17 games in a row with that rotation. It makes absolutely no no sense. But they had guys, you know, pitch and pitch well and the guys that didn't pitch well they they pitched on the right night and uh here we are but you know like i said earlier i mean the reds never got above 88 wins not at one point this entire season did they get above an 88 win projection the cardinals are at 88 right now so sure um the reds played poorly in september and um you know some of the blame goes to them um because if they would have played better they would still be you know fighting here in the last week but without Jesse Winker, I, I just, I don't think there was any way they were going to get above 88 wins, you know, the, and the projections never said they should have, and that was with Jesse Winker. So yeah, it's just, it's hard to really do anything other than tip your cap. Go Dodgers. Yeah. In case anyone is keeping track at home while we're recording, the Brewers are up four nothing on the Cardinals in the top of the seventh right now. So don't believe it. Yeah, the, the, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Nope. Fuse, fuse to believe it. Yeah. How many nights have we like been texting each other like, oh, they're down in the sixth? And it's like I, when it got to like double digits, I was just like, nope, they're winning every night. Winning every night. I, yeah. I, I you know, I I until I see them lose, I'm I'm gonna believe they're gonna win. I'm with you, man. It's um it sucks. The thing that thing that's I think the thing that's the most irritating is the guys they've spent a ton of money on lately, like the past few years, the gold sprints and the Arenados were just like fine this year you know what i mean it was like the tyler o'neill's that were kicking ass it was the harrison baiters having stretches where they were playing really well when you're like what the hell is happening like you know like you're expecting like when they trade for nolan arenado i said beginning of the year when we started doing this show i was like you know they got i think arenado puts him in the driver's seat for the central i was wrong um because he was pretty rough for most of the season but like that's the thing that's so frustrating is it's like it's not the dudes they spent a ton of money on that you expect and they expect to beat you on a nightly basis it's Harrison Bader and Tyler O'Neill and like Tyler O'Neill's really good. I'm not taking away from him. Uh, but it's those guys that are like beating you as like their homegrown talent. You're like, God, what, what can you do about that? Tyler O'Neill's a superstar, man. He's, awesome. I, he's so good, man. I don't, I want to dislike him, but my goodness, he's, he's fun to watch. He is so talented. Um, man, the ball just, the ball explodes off his bat. He's a great, for a left fielder, I mean, he's as good of a defender as there is. Yeah, he he's is. a problem. And I tell you what, I, I, I've said this, uh, I think, in some of our, our group chats. I'm not sure he's not the best player in the NL Central going into next year. And that might sound crazy, but, man, he is really, really good. And I hope I am dead wrong and he just comes crashing down. Because uh, if he doesn't, that, that Cardinals seems really, really uh, um, really looking scary for the next, you know, they, they got him locked up for several more years um especially if they you know add add more pieces around them yeah because i thought for sure going into the year that their best outfit would be dylan carlson and that shows that i don't know anything about baseball apparently well, he was supposed to be i mean he was yeah. i mean he was the consensus you know rookie of the year front runner at the beginning of the year um and he didn't have a bad year i think he was an above average hitter he hit like a a, a rookie should you know right. jonathan india didn't hit like a rookie should um and honestly i wouldn't be surprised if if Carlson takes a big leap, India, you know, maybe I don't think he's going to take a big step back, but kind of, you know, comes a little bit, you know, closer down to earth. Um, and, and that, that, you know, that'd be a, that might be a really fun thing to watch the next, you know, three or four years is which one of those guys kind of takes off a little more than the other. I think they might be, you know, I think they might be kind of neck and neck over the next couple of years. So that's kind of might be a fun, I know they're different positions and whatnot, but um, you know, both starting the same, you know, full year together um, and, and kind of both, you know, Carlson being the, the, the preseason front runner in India, just, you know, mopping the floor with him this year. It'd be kind of a fun little, little battle going forward. Yeah. Not to mention too, if you're to keep it in the central, Brian Hayes is also still coming up. So that makes it, you know, pretty interesting as well, adding his, him to that, like that list also. So yeah, there's a lot of excitement to look forward to there. Uh, looks like Carlos is going to be joining us here in about a minute. Uh, but which is perfect for the segments we're about to do. Um, we, I mentioned earlier when I talked about like the discrediting of this, of this team, this being the reds, uh, cause we're sick of talking about the Cardinals already. Uh, but in September, 
a man hit seven home runs who really at some points looked very lost this season. We know him as Gino Eugenio Suarez. I was there at GABP the other day when I saw him hit one. It was awesome. I was probably one of like 30 people there that day, um, but it was great um, to see him finding his, looks like he's finding his swing again. Um, it gives you a little bit of confidence to see him, you know, having this going into the off season. Um, hopefully he's not diving in any more pools or cutting any more foods or anything like that. You know, stay away from those or at least just tip this, like walk into the pool or something. Um, but, you know, an awesome month for him. Feels like we're getting, getting his swagger back. Makes you wonder, you know, what the future is of third base for the Reds because, you know, obviously that Mike Moustakis thing has not worked out as well as anyone wanted it to. Um, so, but, you know, you got to feel like, you got to feel very good for Suarez for being, you know, a fan favorite, uh, having, you know, the good vibes only as he's well known to finally see like the good vibes only pay off. And for a guy who like kept saying all year, like, I'm going to find my swing, it's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, you know, most importantly, just I'm so happy for him, you know. Same. Um, he is, you know, sure he makes a lot of money to play baseball, but it's got to be a brutal year when you're so you you're counted on to be, you know, one of the top hitters, and it just it never clicks for you all year, and you never you know you never saw his positive attitude waver um, when he got benched for Mike Mustakis. Uh, he he was the first guy standing up cheering. Um, the other day, you know, there was a, a I think uh, Jose scored um, the winning run. Gino was the first guy out of the dugout. He was, he's a great teammate, great, great guy. It's so easy to reverse. So you're so happy for him. Um, I don't know if this translates into to 2022 or not, but it doesn't hurt. You know, yeah, it, it definitely doesn't hurt. It sure is better than ending the year, you know, where he was. Um so, you know, I, I'm happy for him. Um, you know, since, since Carlos is joining us now, I'll go and get my uh, stat cast dig in um, before he craps on it. Um, but I mean, <laughs> stat cast has said that, that Gino, you know, should have been closer to a, a league average hitter this year. Um, that's not where we want Gino to be. Um, but I, I think it's been a, just a combination of things where he hasn't, you know, hasn't produced well. And then he's also maybe had some, some tough luck added on top of it. Um, playing shortstop that didn't help him. I don't think, you know, I think that could have messed him up too. I think there's just so many things that just didn't go his way. And let's hope it just all clicks and he just rides this all the way into 2022. Good evening, Carlos. Hey, hey buddy. Guys. Good to have you back. We're Glad just in time. Here. You missed our, you missed us tipping our cap to the devil Cardinals. So you didn't have to be around for that. You got to come in. We're talking about some good vibes for the September that Gino had hitting some bombs for us again, looking like the old Suarez. Um, you said all year, don't let Gino get hot. And unfortunately, <laughs> Gino got hot when it was too, a little too late. But we're, uh, we're, we're praying and we're feeling the good vibes going into 2022 for Gino. How you feeling, man? I mean, I'm all on board. I think like pretty much the rest of us. I mean, it probably took us that for him to have this September for us to not jump off the ledges as diehard fans, because it was a pretty rough September. And between him and Joey and, and Nick coming on of late, like, it's just, you know. Kyle Farmer. Coming through. What's that? And Kyle Farmer, he's had a monster month. Well, but that's, I'm, I mean, I'm used to that. So. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> true. We uh, we come to expect that. <laughs> as everyone now leaves the podcast. <laughs> Viewers. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I feel like it's obviously got to be his job, not just because of this month, but, you know, even with this brutal year, like I said, he's had like a Mark Reynolds-esque year where his batting average has been low, but he's still hitting bombs. I don't know how this Mike Moustakas thing works for this team going forward. Obviously, it's a lot of money. I can't imagine he's got much trade value with how much he slumped this year, plus being unhealthy. Um, so I don't know, man. Like, I don't know what they do. I don't know if baseball really does the buyouts like the NBA does, where like, Blake Griffin, like all of a sudden, plays for the Nets for five hundred thousand. Guaranteed. But, yeah, so that's that's pretty tough. Yeah, it's it'll be interesting and uh, see what happens this this off season. I mean, if I was a betting man, I don't think we're going to play one sixty two next year, but who knows? I think we'll get that DH and 
it's like you know like nick said at the beginning of the year you can't have enough good players so i mean even with him struggling give him another off season to get his stuff together get healthy hopefully and i mean positive vibes yeah yeah the dh i mean that definitely you know creates a spot for both of them i would imagine the reds you know, we'll try to move one of them if they can. I mean, that's that's a bigger, you know, trying and doing is two very, very different things. Um, I think if you could just, you know, you, you ha- all things are equal. I think I would take Gino just because I feel like his upside is a lot higher. Um, his floor is a lot lower, um, I feel. But um, Moustakas hasn't really had a monster year in, quite a few years and I still feel like at least there's a potential for that with Suarez um but Suarez is a little cheaper and he might be an easier player to move you know especially with the September so I might be like hey you know what we'll take a shot you know um especially if there's a DH um so I, I don't know it'll be interesting I mean there's there's ways to move those kind of contracts like you know similar like Homer Bailey um where you, you attach a prospect to it you, know, you get something else back in return. Um, you know, that that's certainly a way to do it. Um, another idea that I thought was, um, you know, maybe you find um, a relief pitcher or a pitcher um, similar to like Kevin Gossman, you know, remember when the Reds got him in 2019, oh God, yeah. remember he was kind of a, he was, he was a salary dump from the, the Braves when the Reds picked him up um, off of waivers um kind of pick up a player like that that you like their upside that the team the team that has them kind of use them as a bad contract you know you can never have enough pitchers to you know for for next year especially if and i know we got some questions on this especially if the reds do you know decide to move mally or gray or someone you know you could bring in another pitcher there's ways to get around it it's not going to be easy and uh nick crawl's got to be creative as hell to find a way but you know there are options to move one of them um if you can find a way to get it done, but the CBA, that the whole nother wrench thrown into all this, that's, it's going to be a wild off season or yeah, a very boring off season until that gets figured out. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Did I said like the negotiations start up with winter meetings. Does anyone know this? Oh, negotiations are already starting, but I mean, officially, yeah. Like at around the winter meetings is when they'll, when they'll kick off, like say they're having serious talks and reports and, you know, certain meetings and time like that. But they, I mean, they've been talking for the last couple of years about what they're going to bring to the table and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I believe all of the, um, all of the options, um, all of like the, the player options and then the qualifying offers, those will all be done before the CBA expires. I believe, I think I read that uh, uh, those will all be decided before that. Um, but I can't imagine teams are going to be, you know, really going hard in the free agent market until that's been decided or, or there's a, a path at least looking for that. Could that play in the Reds' favor for Castellanos, knowing that, like, there potentially could not be a season as a, like, or a delayed start? Can't hurt. I mean, I don't, no. I don't, I, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, going to get it over the top, but. I mean, yeah, it doesn't there's hurt. gonna there's gonna be no discount on Nick with his agent. So that's true. No that's what a happens, good point. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't even think about the Scott Boris effect. Well, like I said, Carlos came in at a really good time because now we're gonna talk about the great Joey Votto, a 35 home run season. Um, that home run he hit the other day when I was at the stadium that went to the back of the left field Sun Moon deck was insane um our guy jamie Shout ramsey, out Juan francisco <laughs> our guy jamie ramsey circled where the ball landed and i saw it there and i saw it in the air and it was one of those like as soon as it left the bat you knew it was gone kind of things but like seeing like the trajectory in the air of it was kind of amazing it's, uh, i mean it's crazy because nobody's talking about how he was out in front of that ball yeah like he hit and then he swung like it was he was out in front of it like he got fooled a bit and still hit it seven miles yeah it's insane man it's just awesome um that grown man strength yeah man that's like that like (laughs) hitting the gym doing all the things he does there keeping in shape swing um 
obviously, you know, this post all star break, just so fun to watch. You know, the seven homers in seven days was awesome. Um, just the fact he was consistently battling, he missed a month of the year and still is two homers away from his career high with a trip to Pittsburgh coming up where his career he's raked. So possibly could see him uh, breaking his career high or tying in homers. Um, but the consummate leader, the fact that we still know for at least two more years, he's a red barring anything happening, which he has that no trade clause, obviously. So, and as Nick is rocking today uh, in his sweet t-shirts, um, obviously our hero on this show, obviously one of Carlos's good friends. So it's been a freaking joy to see Joey Votto be Joey Votto. Yeah, it, it was good. Um, it, it's been fun from the beginning. It's it kind of stinks that he, you know, got sick in spring and basically missed spring training. And then he still ended up, you know, hitting the ball really well in April. Um, like really, really well. There was no yeah. results to show for it, but we kind of knew it was coming. And then, you know, May comes around um, and, you know, the results start falling and then, you know, it gets hit in the hand, misses another, however long it was, four or six weeks, comes back and then just goes on a monster tear. And then, you know, went on a little bitty slump there at the, what was it, maybe the beginning of September and of August. And then just, you know, comes right back up and, you know, just talking with him and, and you know, going through his off season stuff and see how he's working out. You know, he'll, you know, we never get too deep into it, but he'll say, Hey man, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm excited about this season. And, and, and that's the way he was this off season. He was, he was super pumped. He's like, you know, sending me, you know, videos of, you know, hitting off the tee and then the exit velocity. And you're like, Jesus, that's just off a of tee. Like, he's doing something different. Like he's in the lab this off season. And, and, you know, that's why at the beginning of the year, whenever we made our predictions, it wasn't, you know, Joey's just my good friend. I'm going to say he's going to win the MVP. He's going to, you know, hit really well just because he's my buddy. But it was like, you know, he's telling me he's going to do it. He hasn't ever told me something that he's going to do and then not do it. So, and, and I'm pretty sure Reds country can kind of feel with that because, you know, whenever we've doubted him the last couple of years, look at us, like, look at him now. Like everybody said, you know, after that long streak, I'll never doubt him again. And it's just, it's crazy how these, these players, like you hear about the Tom Brady's and the Michael Jordan's and the Jeter's, like they can all tell when something special is going to happen. And when they say it and it comes true, it's, it's just fun to watch, fun to be a part of. And I'm just glad that we can get to talk about it together and, you know, share it with everybody else. Yeah, I mean he's he's ninth in baseball and expected weighted on base average uh, ahead of just ahead of uh, Tatis Jr. and Otani. I mean that's that's how good he's been. Um, just yeah, an unbelievable season. The only player that kind of comes to mind that kind of did this, you know, kind of had a resurgence this this um, at this age is 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 Big Poppy. I don't I can't think of anyone else that. You know, there's been some players like I don't know, like Chipper Jones who like, really played great into his, but he he didn't have like a, a dip and back up, you know, because usually when it's a dip and it, it's a dip, you know, there there's no back up. I think you Big know, Poppy say did the same thing. What's that? You know, Griffey did the same thing. King Griffey Jr. Yeah, man. All star at 37. I don't know if it was this good, but uh... <laughs> no, it wasn't this good. No, not not, not this good. Stumper. <laughs> King Griffey Jr. What other Griffey do you know? <laughs> Senior? I, I mean, eh, yeah, I mean, you know, Votto's OPS is 100 points higher than than, than Griffey at, at that age. So, I mean, that's, it, yeah, I mean, that's that's insane. Like, Griffey, the, the first ever unanimous Hall of Famer. Like, he has 100 right. points higher OPS at this age. Like, so, so, like right now, where do you think do you think Joey will be in top ten in MVP voting or top fifteen? Oh, that stupid month that he missed, man! It would be, it would be close. I, I, I think, think he's gonna be in the top ten. I think he'll get in the top ten. I mean, I, I think it'll be, it'll he's probably gonna be right around that that fringe. It's gonna be such a weird NL MVP vote because all all of the top players are gonna miss the playoffs. Like our I love it. Tatis, Vado. I mean, Max Muncy's probably. Am I missing? Is probably the only like legit candidate that's going to be in the playoffs. 
Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Let's just want to give it to the whole Giants team. Like, you know, yeah. I, I don't. Is there anyone else? Am, am I missing someone else? Yeah. I swear to God, if Buster Posey, Freddie Freeman, play. maybe Freeman's probably up there. Yeah, I don't mean none of the Cardinals. Yeah. I don't think are 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 MVP range. Um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of guys that. And that's just that's that's how baseball is. It's so funny yeah. that you can, you know, have the best players and they don't make the playoffs. And that's why it's so dumb that people use the playoffs against Joey Votto. Just look at the NL MVP vote this year and say it's stupid to ever compare baseball yeah, players I, to playoffs. I don't know if you saw, but I put that silly question on Twitter, like who is Joey more comparable, Tom Brady or LeBron James? <laughs> and I got, well, how dare you? Joey's never won a playoff game. I'm like, oh, gosh, here we go. Yes, he has, but. <laughs> yeah. Or series, whatever it is. And I'm like, what do you I know he should have got on base more than 50% of the time in that. Right. That yeah, I said he should have hit twice in the lineup and pitched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think people forget that 2012 Giants series. He hit 390. He got on base. 50% of the time in that series. Yeah. Like I just, what do you, what do you want him to do? I, I view, I view like playoffs. I only view it as like an extra thing. Like, right. like David Ortiz, like he definitely deserves extra credit for what he did in the playoffs, but I, I don't view what someone did or didn't do as someone didn't do as like a deterrent to any hall of fame. Cause that's just, it's silly. It's we're talking like a sample of like two months for a guy's entire career postseason stats for guys that were in the playoffs a lot like that's so yeah. small it's just and it, and it gets usually elite pitching yeah. what if Derek Jeter was on the Pirates his entire career right yeah like you know we referenced Griffey earlier he made the playoffs Ooh. three times his whole career three times he played in one ALCS Bottles played in the playoffs more than, than Griffey yeah four right yeah four yeah wow. Ken Giraffe Jr. Oh man, but yeah, I think uh, you know we talked about it last week. I feel like we're all pretty confident that you know, especially at this pace. I don't know if he'll have this pace. Like, certainly hope so. I'm sure he believes he will. Um, that when his time is done in Cincinnati, he will be the franchise all-time home run leader. And I hope to be there the day he does it. And I will 100% make the road trip to Cooperstown when he makes a speech. I will make sure I am there. We're if all there. there. And he hits up in that homer. Will you run on the field? No, because I'll bail um, you out. You still got that big league money you can get me out? I'm sure my wife's got some tucked under the couch or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, mine does too. <laughs> so, um, kind of before we get into, we got some questions that what people want to we're at, how to ask for us. But real quick, I think one of the things this year that this month, particularly, people are talking about is a lot of new faces that came to the Reds, which was good and frustrating for some people. Um, guys like Jose Barrero, TJ Friedel, Delano DeShields Jr., Reimer San Martin, who I was blown away with seeing him pitch in person for his debut. I thought he was awesome. Um, and also looks just like Jimmy Butler, the NBA player. Definitely. That was wild. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then we got a couple more guys there. But uh, Moretta, who I also saw pitch, Really good stuff. I mean, like, I had really good seats that game, and his stuff was pretty nice. Um, and then O'Brien, who didn't have the best start yesterday, you saw David Bell kind of manage with urgency as he was one and two-thirds in before he went to Sessa. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of people, and I'm going to be very unpopular here, I'm well aware, but, and this is a total small sample size, the line of the Shields wasn't awful at the plate his time, like, that three or four weeks he was here. Like, he was no, he awesome. But he wasn't terrible. Yeah, he's he's played well. I mean, I you know I definitely think that would be exposed over, you know, any yes. sort of you know large sample. But you know, I mean, the Reds were kind of at a point with with Winker out and um, Senzel. I mean, where where they they didn't have a lot of options against you know left handed pitching, and uh, um, I think they were you know looking for uh, something. And, and uh, yeah, he, he played well. I mean, I don't. So I don't, I, I'm not going to like be like, yeah, that was the right move. Right. Great yeah, job on either. Delino. But I'm not going to sit there and, you know, crap on the guy that played well either. Um, I've been impressed with, 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 with TJ Friel. I know last night was a really, really rough ball game for him. Um, 
but um but yeah he 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 you know he he's hit well um and i i think for every report i've heard is he's a a better defender than hitter so I, it's it's funny how I what you so. see in what you see in like you know two two week samples but um yeah he's a guy that you know hey maybe he can get into the mix next year um he just kind of seems like a guy that that and this is something the reds were really really i feel lacking this year when, when a guy went down for injury the reds had no one in triple a they could call up I, he seems like a guy that you can send to triple a to start the year next year and, you know, the first outfit injury you can call him up and you're going to feel comfortable with him, you know, and, and that's, that's, it's way more important than I think we, we often, you know, think or give credit to. Yeah, he'll be a, he'll be a 4A guy and, you know, this, all these call-ups and stuff, it's, it's fine, you know, I'm not putting too much weight on, on any of them really, other than Schrock, like he got a lot of playing time and he did pretty well you know yeah it's pretty cool to see like i think he's got a legitimate shot to make the team next year no matter you know who they bring in especially if they lose nick then, then he'll definitely make the team but um you know barrero he's gonna he's gonna get his time that, that's been kind of an odd one lately i know you know whenever he got called up i was you know making the case why he's not playing and why you know why he shouldn't be playing and then towards the end, you know, I kind of wanted him to see to get some more ABs, and and he wasn't getting those, and I don't know why, but it's got to be a good reason, you know. I mean, David Bell's just not going to play him because he doesn't want to play him. I mean, you know, once you get once you get to the big leagues, your prospect uh, status doesn't matter. David Bell has no idea what prospect number you were. You know, he sees what he sees. He goes off of last year. He goes off of spring training. He goes off of what the Triple A manager told him, and you know, he puts him in where he sees fit. And you know, I trust it, and I don't see other, any other reason why we shouldn't. Um, you know, some of the other some of the other guys. I'm just kind of looking at the the box score right now. And see, we got one hit, one freaking hit. <laughs> Yeah, you can see, you can see I mean, the, the pitchers, they're going to they're going to be up and down all, you know, all year next year. I mean, I'm not worried about the pitching of the starting pitching. The bullpen should be OK with the guys that they can bring back and you know, that's not counting any additions or anything like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm not too down on what they have at AAA to get with it, you know, to, to pick from there next year when people get hurt and stuff like that, because, you know, you've seen guys get called up and they're, they're capable and they're able to do what they can. Like, you know, um, as good as Santion's been, he might start in AAA. Like, and he's been really solid, you know, out of the bullpen. You know, they might want to make him a starter again. Who knows? But like I said, I'm just, I'm not too down on, on what they have and able to choose from from down there next year. Yeah, I mean, Brewer has started five of the last 10 games. I know it probably hasn't felt like that, um, but he has been out there and he's, <laughs> he's got some yeah. pinches. He's been double switched in. Um, and anything you can give him this year is good. You know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, are said he, he, he didn't get, you know, um, um, more playing time or, or, or sit in triple a, I think Carlos, you said, I mean, you know, I, I think they've seen it all they can see at triple a. And I think this is just good to get his feet wet. I, yeah, I personally, absolutely. I think it's great that he's come up and Kyle Farmer has raked in September. I think that's great. I think that's a, a and Carlos, you can speak this way better than we can. I think that's the thing that goes, Hey, you know what? Hey, I better, I better do my work this off season. I better come to spring training ready. If I want to get the oh, yeah. shortstop job. Um, yeah. And I, I know everyone looks at that as a down thing. I competition's a good thing. Yeah. And there's like, you know, back to the Barrero thing, like who knows what could be going on? Like every, every player is different. Every player is a different person. Like you can be 21 and ready to go out the gate like Ken Griffey Jr. Or you could be 21 and be more like Barrero where it takes you a little longer to get used to it. You know, he's in a different country. Like, yes, he's been here before, but I mean, he's he's seeing the bright lights. He's seeing the biggest hotels. He's seeing all the fans. Like, it's a different world out there. And he's, a, you know, yeah, he's a pro ball player, but this is his first time ever being a real pro ball player. That affects people differently. You know, I can speak to my minimal time. Whenever I was up there with the Padres, like, I hardly knew anybody. I feel like if I would have got called up with the Reds, I would have felt way more comfortable because I knew the catcher, I knew the first baseman, I knew the left fielder. You know, when I went to the Reds, I, I knew nobody. It was, I mean, when I went to the Padres, I knew nobody. It was like being the new kid in school. 
it, it has, you know, a different effect on people. Maybe somebody else that wouldn't affect it the way that it affected me. But, you know, it, it had a small percentage of the way that I performed. Somebody else that might not at all. So that's just kind of like a different factor to think of whenever you're talking about like Barrero and maybe, maybe they see that he's not ready. He needs a little bit more seasoning and that could be just outside the ropes, not inside the ropes. Cause that stuff matters. I love that. play the other day. Yeah. I love that. I love that they're playing him in center field uh, position too. flexibility, man. I uh, push that as much as you can, you know, so you don't get stuck with a Eugenio Suarez playing shortstop, but the other way around, you know, getting stuck, playing someone in center field that that's not as capable, um, you know, at worst, Kyle Farmer is a really good defensive shortstop. So if you're, you know, if you have both of them on the field together, you know, at least you're going to, you know, have, have, have some good defense. So, yeah, I, I, I like that they've tried that. Why not? I don't, I don't think it hurts him. I don't think it's going to kill him. Plenty of guys have played center field and shortstop and, or center field and third base or whatever, and, and been fine. Yeah, I think also when people complain about the Kyle Farmer thing, like, let's not forget, there were years when, like, Edgar Renteria was playing shortstop for the Reds. Like, we we sat through that. Like, we dealt with that. Uh, Wilson Valdez one year played shortstop for the Reds. So, like, I'm cool with Kyle Farmer. I'm all in. So, yeah, I think we should kind of take it back again and just remember – the short stuff we've had to get through to where we're now having the situation of a really good player and potentially Jose Barrero. So. Yeah. And look at the, the red shortstops in, in 2010, 2012 and 2013 and the production they got, the Reds got so oh, much man. more this year. Um, so it, you know, I mean, it all adds up different ways and, you know, you, you want to have as many good players, as many good positions, but you know, you can't get by with, with, uh, you know, not a lot of offense production there. If you, if you have really good pieces elsewhere. Yeah, you can't get by with Orlando Cabrera anymore. That is second. Oh, still stinks. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like Carlos kind of mentioned the pitching and how he felt pretty confident, and I agree. Uh, we talked about the start of the show. Um, I had to say, I, I made a mention for it for a second, and I really like getting Carlos's take, obviously, especially on pitchers, as far as like their big league debut and what he sees from them. Um, but San Martin, you know, I was at the game Monday, like I said, and I had pretty, I had really good seats. I was right, you know, a little bit off the home dugout. Um, and just kind of seeing like his, like the way he carried himself on the mound and just, I, I understand it's a makeup game on a Monday afternoon against the pirates. So I'm not going to, you know, take anything away from what it was. Um, but he attacked every batter. He battled with everybody. If he got in situations where like, you know, he was losing in a bat. He battled back in it. I was, I was really impressed. Like, you know, if that's a guy that's going to be starting the season at Louisville next year, like that's the guy I'm excited about his future. Again, only five and two thirds innings. I'm well aware, but I was pretty impressed with what he did in that game. Yeah. I mean, you could, you tell he's, he's different than a lot of the guys that they had come and make spot starts and even come out of the bullpen. He's like you said, very poised, carries himself well, act I mean, acted like he belonged there. Like you could tell right. he wasn't like you know, looking around for the balls coming from or, you know, anything like that after he strikes a guy out. Like he, you know, it was just another day at the park for him. And that's, that's encouraging. And his stuff was, was really good. It was, it was really good. I'm excited to watch him pitch again next year. I got to admit too, that was a decent cut with, that was a decent swing. Not terrible. <laughs> yeah, his, um, it was like like fielding independent pitching and, and stuff was a lot a lot better than his ERA at uh, at Triple A didn't you know didn't walk too many guys didn't give a lot of home runs struck out an above average rate so um, yeah I mean I don't want to make too much about you know that start in that spot but hey it was positive you know and and, and uh, um, yeah I think nice guy to have starting the year in Triple A next year um, that hey if if you, you know because there's going to be you know times you need you know for a doubleheader or whatnot and hey, Hey, call him up and, um, and there'll be injuries. You know, there'll definitely be injuries. So, yeah, happens over here. I think we're at the point now where we got some fan questions. So, I'm pretty excited for these. Uh, obviously, like I said, being of this show, thank you to everyone who's sent us these all year and hung out with us all year. This has been awesome. Um, so, some of these we're seeing reality, some, some names that we've seen before, and some are, uh, some new people, so we're excited. So we're going to go first with our guy from WV Redlegs. I know Carlos and him uh, trade off their grill pictures on Twitter. 
and it just makes me want to go visit that nice meat with you guys yeah the brisket that you get down there is probably way better than the brisket i get here right well, i'm sure you could get some quality meat up there just gotta pay yeah. for it yeah that's right um his question's a good one it's what do you think the Reds should do with the catcher situation heading into 2022? Stevenson needs to be in the lineup, but should he, with the possibility of a nationally DH, be more focused on first base? Um, obviously, the big cloud over the head here is Tucker Barnhart's in his free agent year. So um, I think a lot of people have kind of said Tucker Barnhart's kind of the perfect backup catcher as far as like that defensive guy you can count on who can make things happen and kind of control a game. Um I do agree. Tyler Stevenson needs to get as many at bats as possible. I think he was tremendous this year. I think we all kind of feel that way. Um, but if there's a situation where they can keep Tucker Barnhart back you know, on the team, I would love it. But I don't feel confident in that because I feel like some team is going to want him to be their everyday catcher. I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, I think they're gonna if they're gonna spend money this all season, then they'll keep him because he will be. The perfect backup, like I, I think Stevenson should start. He should focus on catching next year um, or this off season, and you know he'll, he'll take his ground balls and stuff like that at first base if that DH comes. I'm not not worried yeah. about that. He's fine over there already. Um, but I mean, it's, it's all about if they're going to spend money or not, or whether we'll see Tucker back in the Reds uniform. I mean, he's right. He's, he's the perfect guy to have there because if Stevenson goes down, you're you're not going to be hurting too bad at the catching position, you know? So. Yeah. I just, I think if you kind of look through the, the reds salaries, even if they do add payroll, I just, I don't see how the, the money adds up to, to spend uh, basically 7 million because he has a, a seven and a half million dollar option, but you had to pay 500,000 to buy him out. So it's, it's a 7 million. I just, that's, that's a lot of money for a, a, a backup catcher um, with the, the other needs you're going to have. Um, I, I think everyone sees, Oh, well, if, if Nick Cassianos is gone, that's 16 million. If Wade Malley doesn't come back, that's 10 million or, you know, uh, Tyler Malley and Luis Castillo are going to get big raises um, this, this off season. Um, so I, I just, I don't see how the money works out, you know, the, the Reds um, uh, non-tendered Casale last year, their Giants picked him up for $2 million. So that's a $5 million difference for your backup catcher. Um, that's, that's a lot of money. And um, um, I know something I will really get into during, you know, our off season shows is probably, you know, guys at target and things. And uh, I talked to our buddy clay about that a lot guy that really would make a lot of sense for the Reds as a free agent would be Jan Gomes. Uh, Cause he mashes left-handed pitchers. So if the Reds, um, um, you know, did play Tyler Stevenson, maybe at first base against left-handed pitchers, uh, he would slide really well in because Tyler Stevenson is not going to catch 162 games. Um, so, yeah, I just, I, I think Tucker Barn is probably worth that seven and a half million. I just don't think he's worth that to the Reds with their other needs and, and, and where they're at. Depends too if uh, he's got a good relationship with Bob. He's got a good relationship, and he's back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you're just trying to get everyone in up. We're going to Carlo, aren't you? <laughs> all right, this is from since Chris at Cincy Action. Is it at all realistic to hope they keep Castellanos, Miley, and Tucker without trading another large contract? Not counting Shogo or Moose, as they at any rate would be impossible to trade without packaging prospects. Is it realistic? Sure. Is it likely? I don't know. Um, I, you know, I think we all kind of, you guys can tell me if you disagree. Um, I think we're all kind of in the expectation that Nick Castellanos will not be a red next year. And that's not because he doesn't want to be. It's because he's going to be the best available hitting free agent in baseball. Um, it just is what it is. Um, the reds are going to have to match someone a lot of money. And like Nick said, they have a lot of needs right now that they're you know going to have to attack. Um, so Padres need a right fielder, right? You know, they're, you know, that's a good fit for him. I'm sure that the Phillies would love to have him hitting in front of Bryce Harper next year. Um, when Andrew McCutcheon's not there anymore. So, you know, who knows, man? Um, obviously I would love nothing more to see Nick Castellanos playing for the Reds again next year, but I, I don't feel the confident that we're going to see all three of those guys back. Maybe I feel the most confident way to be back of the three. 
so I kind of did some rough math kind of looking through the, the payroll. So if the Reds uh, declined Barnhart's option, picked up Miley's and uh, Castellanos walks, the Reds payroll is actually right about where it's at now, which, you know, because of the raises. Um, now, again, they could be creative and, and you know, move, move stocks or swears, like our question said, and that, that frees up some money. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Reds are going to have to increase payroll um, to keep Cassianos or to sign really any other big free agent. Um, I would almost think it's probably more likely if, if the Reds are increasing payroll that it is for Nick Cassianos than a, a, a free agent. Uh, Bob tends to really be drawn to the fan favorites. Um, and, and when we say Bob, we really should say the ownership group because Bob does not make the sole decisions of all these things. He's only a part part of the ownership group um but they do seem more more likely to to pay their own players you know and increase salary or increase payroll for that so um yeah i mean i think it's possible um but yeah i think that you go into our next question because it kind of was what i was about to say next <laughs> what's the percentage chance that nick ever yeah. has of nick castellanos returning Who's that from? Make sure we shout him out. That is from Ethan Fulkerson. I'm yeah. saying right now, 25%. I think it's literally probably about exactly. I'll, I'll go 30. I'll be more optimistic. So, I'm, I'm more like 15 to 20. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, I, I would I'd take him over anybody else who's available right now. Take him over like a you know, you know, a number three starter, number two star, like he's just in there every day. He's grinding. He works hard. Like he's very fun to watch. Um, been nothing but great for the team, for the city. It'd be nice to have him back and, and make another run at it for a little bit. Yeah, I think, you know, and this isn't just because we've had Ryan on the show a couple of times and the way Ryan talks about, like, I think he genuinely really likes it here. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it seems like he really enjoys being a red. He talks a lot about like what this, what the fan base means as far as like how you can tell how passionate the fans are and how he really loves that. So I don't necessarily know if that is going to get in the way of money. It won't. Um, but you know, it's one of the things where like, hopefully you can use your advantage. Um, you know, I know he played for the Cubs for a half a year and their fans are pretty crazy. Um, but I don't know, man. Um, yeah, it'd be awesome. It'd be super cool to see him here for another couple of years. Um, but God, the top just... of that lineup with India and Stevenson, Winker. Like we already yeah. forgot about Winker. He's been gone six weeks and we're like, we haven't even mentioned him. Like you gotta, maybe you... at the beginning of the show, but yeah, you gotta think uh, Tyler Maker and Cody back. Motto, like Stevenson, and if we get half of Suarez back, like oh. Yeah, Tyler Naquin's more than likely going to be on the team again next year. I can't imagine the Reds are going to let him go for nothing. So he won't be nothing. He will get a he will get an arbitration raise. So that's why the Indians let him go. The Reds got him for a lot cheaper than the Indians could have uh, had. That's him. why Bob told Barrero to take him out so he won't be as expensive. <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Um, Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I would I would be very disappointed if they didn't didn't bring make one back for a couple million bucks i mean he's definitely a uh a really solid hitter against right-handed pitching he's a kirby favorite say it hey I, i've been wrong about a lot i was damn right about tyler naquin this year so i'm writing that out <laughs> hopefully they change his name Nakeen. i think i think that actually is how it is but no one wants to do it because it just doesn't sound as cool he doesn't correct anybody either so it just, it sounds somewhat, Nick one sounds so much cooler. I mean, uh, especially when he hits homers. Yeah. yeah. So that brings us to uh, Kyle Carlson, um, kind of going along with the trend here. Um, what free agents do we let go? What free agents do we resign, if any? Um, I think Michael Lorenz will be back. I don't think he's going to have a giant market. Uh, that's not to say he's a bad player. Um, but I don't know a lot of teams are going to be like chopping up the bit to pay a reliever a lot of money. And I think he's got a good relationship with the organization. Um, I think he really likes the idea that he can play two ways that the Reds allow him to, as far as like being in the outfield and getting at bats, we've seen him really cherish and relish his opportunities in the past. So I think that there are for sh I think he'll be back with the team. Actually, there's probably like a 5% chance that Lorenzen's back. Really? 
Yeah, he was paid as a starter this year. Um, ah, it, okay. If Lorenzen wouldn't have been wouldn't have been considered a starter, the Reds would have not tendered him. Um. So yeah, I think someone is going to give him starter money. Um, whether he can actually, you know, work as a starter, I don't know. Remains to be so seen. The Giants. Yeah, probably. Yeah, he will probably yeah. he will probably win the Cy Young for the the Giants next year. Um, that'd be a great ballpark for him to play in, especially like yeah. with the ability to play center field and and, and and Kapler's you know creativity. Oh, don't why'd you put that out there? Oh, but yeah, I I don't, I I like would, Giants he, he honestly might be the I I, I hate the the Giants because of 2012, but uh, man, secretly I I they're hard to root against. I love the way they built their team and. That is exactly like literally do every single thing the Giants did this year. That's what I want the Reds to do. It's flawless. But, um, but yeah, I actually think he's probably out of anyone probably the least likely to return. I would say Barnhart's more likely to return. What do I know then? Well, it's you know I like I think if you're if you're viewing as a reliever, sure. But I think there's going to be, I think the Reds have really we've been spoiled with our starting pitching. What do you Over the last couple here? years, there's a lot of teams that are just so desperate for starting pitchers. I mean, look at some of the, the starters that were signed this offseason for like, you know, five, six, seven, eight million dollars. Like, they're not good. Um, and, and Lorenz is at least, I think, close to a league average pitcher, you know, maybe a little less as a starter, but that's still valuable to teams. Even like a guy with a 4.5 ERA that can eat you 150 innings, that is valuable for teams. i'll just skip this question <laughs> yeah i guess the more you think of it i'm like man michael lorenzo pitching for the oakland days makes sense like, that big ballpark he's probably gonna want to hit yeah he can dh there well yeah like i don't think he's gonna get the otani treatment and be able to definitely not. i don't think he's earned I think that he's gonna yet. try to push for it a lot because this is probably like his last chance because if he doesn't get it next year then that's, that's going to be a wash. Like it's going to be gone out the window. So he's probably has like one more hurrah. You saw like, you know, at the end of this year, a couple of times he tried to talk David Bell into getting an AB and he wouldn't let it happen. That's just because he was hurt all year or a lot of the year. So. Well, then what after happened in his first game back, they're like, Nope, Nope. Yeah. We are not doing this. <laughs> yeah. I was at that game. That sucked. Oh man. Uh, we got another question I want to throw in. I, I think we have another one too, but it kind of goes right along with what we're saying. Max, if you could pick one of the three, Miley, Tucker, or Castellanos to come back, who is it? Um, I mean, I would definitely pick Castellanos. I mean, Same. Definitely has the most impact. I think Miley's the most likely of the three. Um, I think Miley could get traded. I think Miley's option to get picked up and he gets traded this offseason. That would make a lot of sense for the Reds. Um, but everyone in agreement, Castellanos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Castellanos. I'd, I'd go in that order too. Castellanos, Miley, Tucker. Yeah, I, there's just something about the dude that when the game's on the line, he wants the bat in his hand. You got to like that dude, so. Who? Miley? Yeah, Miley. <laughs> Could knock a double real quick on you. Yeah. You got to You just had to. I had to. I'm, it's sorry. Like... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Birds are down six nothing in the eighth to the the White Sox, and they never- still have one hit. Oh, Two I don't know. Now. I don't know. I've been all in on the show, boys. All in on the show. And the the Brewers are up four nothing. Well, they got two. The bottom of the ninth. Don't course, believe it. Double magic. Definitely. Double magic still there. It is. So speaking of the Brewers, um, Brewers pitcher Devin Williams <clears throat> fractured his hand punching a wall. Carlos. Have you or a teammate ever been got hurt celebrating being angry in your in your career? I haven't. Um, teammates have. I'm trying to think who was somebody in Double A. This was my question. Um, <laughs> dang it! I forget who it was in Double A. I'm sure I'll think of it soon. Um, hopefully before the end of the show. But yeah, somebody got hurt like punching the paper towel dispenser like that cheap plastic i'm like oh <laughs> you go for the softest thing that dug out and you still break your hand <laughs> God, who was it i can't remember i'll think of, oh my buddy uh 
David Schaefer. He was a good reliever. He, uh, I think he got put man on. He got put on the forty man with the A's. Um, he got picked up by the A's. He got put on the forty man uh, with them. But he he had a really good double uh, A year in two thousand six. And he might have had a, like a one bad outing or something like that. And he went in there and busted it up. And that was it. That was the end of him with the Reds. What, can, what is, like, how would you, how does Devin Williams, like, recover from that? Like, you don't. Like, I mean, I mean you're going to miss the. You're not going to want to see him around the clubhouse. I'll tell you that. Oh, and you're going to miss the playoffs? Like. Just because you got drunk and then you got mad, like probably at a girlfriend or why yeah. I don't know, married or whatever, and then freaking punched a hole because he had too many beers, too many white claws or whatever. <laughs> Seems like a white claw guy. <laughs> so he, he he's the, a uh, off-brand white claw. <laughs> yeah, he's more of a he's more of a truly. Yeah, definitely a truly guy for sure. <laughs> Who was the uh, Angels pitcher in like 06 or 07 that got injured playing Guitar Hero? Do you remember that? Oh, uh, I, I, CJ Wilson? It might have been. It seems like a CJ Wilson type thing. That happened to a couple of people too during that, that double A year. I remember the spring training. Was that banned? <laughs> banned from the clubhouse? Yeah. Um, no Guitar Hero in Chattanooga. Everyone's got blisters. Clubhouse. <laughs> in the uh <laughs> in my brief time up there when I we went to go play in San Francisco, San Francisco had the uh like not the duck hunter, but it was some sort of like handheld game. And Jake Peavy was in there and he lost and he busted that gun up and broke it on the side of the, <laughs> the video game. <laughs> Everybody's like looking back, like, what happened? <laughs> and he's just by himself beating it up. I'm I I, I yeah. never asked you this. Because you were there the year after the 2007 uh, why, uh, game 163 between the Padres and Rockies, right? Mm-hmm. Did you ever hear anything, any crazy stories or anything about that? Just because that's one of my favorite baseball games ever. No, they didn't. That's something they just never touched. Word about it. Never, never mentioned. No, but not even like in spring training or anything. They never brought it up and... Never said, "Hey, we were this close. We're gonna do this." It wasn't. It wasn't about that. It was like it was a brand new, brand new team. With there's no looking back, really. Whenever you're, you know, during spring training or anything like that, there's there's no point on it. Even if you won the World Series, who cares what you did a couple of months ago? It's all moving forward. So that uh, that '07 Rockies team has one of my favorite stories of all time. So you know, that was the team that played the Red Sox in the series. And um, so this is in Frank Kona's book, actually. He was talking, I read this, I read his book and they were talking about, so there was like, I think they were going to Colorado from Fenway. Jeff Francis started the last game in Fenway before they went to Colorado. And Pedroia like hit like a bomb off of him over the monster, like just crushed it. So Pedroia is trying to get into the uh, road clubhouse at Colorado. And they're like, we can't let you in. He's like, I'm Dustin Pedroia. I played for the Red Sox in the second baseman. Kind of similar to that story of Joey when he's at Wrigley. And he's like, hey, tell them who I am kind of thing. Yeah. And they're like, they got, they're like we can't let you in. He's like, here's my MLB PA ID. Like, I'm Dustin Pedroia. And they're like, sir, we apologize. We can't let you in. We can't prove who you are. And he goes, why don't you go in there and ask Jeff Francis who the fuck I am? <laughs> Sorry for saying the F word, but I just I, I feel like Sorry. I wasn't doing this story any justice if I didn't use it. So I mean the Padres made all the necessary moves. They brought in the right players to go for that championship run in 08. That's, some of their players just didn't perform. Jeff Francis won start with the Reds, man. I, for, I, I remember that. He was actually, I think, on the two he's on the 2012 team, and he was yeah. like the the top uh 4A pitcher and no one got hurt all year and he never got up and I think right. I think like you know when you get to June if um, the players have the right to be to say I'm done I want out I think that's what happened with him but yeah I, I remember everyone was expecting him to, to pitch for the Reds at some point that year and it, it never happened oh well yeah it happens or Jeff um, well we um, um, Eric Eric Fedbeck said the uh Thank you for, for your research, Eric. Uh, Joel 
Zamea Zamaya was the, the guitar hero the, injury. The Tigers was the uh, the famous pitcher with the guitar hero injury. Oh, he was yeah. the closer, I think, right? Joel threw like 103. Yeah. Like Roll he was the Chapman first. Light. Like he was one of the first ones. Like, oh my God, this dude's throwing a hundred. And now he's a dime a dozen. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> guy, yeah, guy is like that's nothing. Single man. A doing that just <laughs> dashed <laughs> with a much higher spin rate. Whatever, bro. <laughs> um, before we get out of here, so kind of let you guys know, like uh, Nick said, we are anticipating we're going to be doing shows during the off season um through the rest of the month of october you'll have us on our typical wednesday night um but switching in november at the end of the monday night football run and the nba season starting and my hectic college basketball schedule we'll be going monday nights um but you know same format uh we're going to be going um you know having the live chat you know we're going to be here with you guys during the cba arrangements and the winter meetings and Who's going to still be a red? Who's not going to be a red? Um, we got some cool announcements too that we're working on. Um, some big news. So again, uh, we'll be back here next week. I think that's, is that NL wildcard night or is that AL wildcard It's night? NL wildcard night. So we'll be on like about when, when all that game's going on. Clay, Clay Snowden is going to join us to recap the, the season. Apparently Clay Snowden can re- recap every team in the MLB for us if we needed to. He's a legend, man. I'm going to let him tell us that story when he gets on next week on why he can do that. I bit my tongue when he put that thing out today. The weird clay. (laughs) He he put that thing out today on Twitter, and it took everything in me to not tweet him back where he was like, keep a lookout for the Pirates. They might be pretty good in 2023. You know, (laughs) so badly when they'd be like, stop me if you heard this before. Hey, Tim, you're not allowed to jinx it. You don't jinx it. God damn it, Tim. (laughs) 2023 pirates are going to be the the 21 giants tim did it tim did it again oh, bitch. all right reds is- better go all in in 2022 because it's over in 23 no chance. Is- nick cuts all these videos and like we'll keep these so if, like the pirates going like a six game winning streak in 2023 he'll be like you remember when you said this it's already saved <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, thank you all for this. Really appreciate it. We're excited to be back next week with Clay. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this last week of, you know, I'm keeping on the Mariners. That's the team I'm hoping sneaks in because they're pretty close. So I'm rooting for chaos. I want, I want a game on Monday night. That'd be fun. I'd be all for that. All right. Thank you all. Have a great night and uh, go Reds. See you.